Hi, I'm Amanda Morin, a writer, recovering teacher, and parent advocate. And I'm Lexi Walters-Wright, community manager for understood.org. And we are In It. In It is a podcast from Understood for Parents. On this show, we offer support and some practical advice for families whose kids are struggling with reading, math, focus, and other learning and attention issues. Today, we're talking about that moment when someone asks us, is ADHD even real? This is something that comes up all the time for parents. It is such a common topic in our Understood Community Forums. And in part, that's because there's a lot of misinformation out there about ADHD, which stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And the biggest myth is that it's not a legit condition. Never mind that there's a lot of brain science behind the ADHD diagnosis. There's still people out there who aren't so sure. So we put out a call for parents to tell us about your experiences. So the one that I've been hearing lately and the most often is that ADHD is a made-up disease by the government and big pharma in order to push acid onto kids of African-American descent. Obviously, there are a whole lot of issues with that specific clapback. Uh, I have two boys who have ADHD and have heard all the ridiculous things that people have to say. But my favorite is always when people try to play down the diagnosis in an attempt to make me feel better, not that I need to be made to feel better. So I often get told things like, oh, they'll grow out of it, or it's not really a diagnosis, or my favorite. They're always far too quick to diagnose ADHD. I am a mother of a 10-year-old girl who has ADHD. And one time this came up in conversation with a colleague. And when I mentioned that my daughter has ADHD, my colleague said, oh, that surprises me. And so I said, why does that surprise you? And she said, because I didn't think that you would want that label. And so I kind of took a deep breath and said, well, I don't see it as a label. It's actually a neurological condition. And then I explained a little bit more. And I think she was absolutely not trying to be hurtful or even realize that her comment may have been hurtful. She was simply trying to understand. Um, but I think what the comment put on display is a misconception that a lot of people have and perhaps that I had before I was forced to learn about ADHD because of my daughter's diagnosis, which is a perception that it's not a real medical diagnosis. It's something fabricated as an excuse for either attention or to explain away bad behavior. Amanda, is this a question that you get? (laughs) Yes. And as you know, Lexi, I have both a son and a spouse with ADHD. So when does it usually come up? Like, what are the circumstances? Yeah. So, Lexi, it's not always a dark question. And sometimes it's that verbal side eye from another parent, like, when they're watching my awesomely delightful and scattered son move super fast on the playground. He bumps into people, he interrupts conversations, and I'll be like, whoa, he is having a really rough day with his ADHD. And the other parent will say something like, does he really have ADHD? He's so focused when he's at our house playing with Legos or whatever. I get the sense that this is maybe a fraught question for you. Yeah, 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 it can be. You know, when I get asked if ADHD is real, it feels like I'm being judged. It feels like people are commenting on my parenting. It feels like they're passing judgment on whether I can keep my kid under control. And it sometimes feels like they're watching me make excuses for my child when I'm not making excuses. I'm just telling it like it is. Yeah. I want to know, so if someone asked a parent like me, a parent who has a child with ADHD, whether ADHD was real, how would you recommend that that parent answer the question? I would say, um, well, let me know why you're asking that. First, I want to know, because that's kind of rude. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Stephanie Sarkis is a psychotherapist who works with children and adolescents. She's one of Understood's experts. 
So first, I'd want to know, you know, tell me what your concerns are. I mean, maybe it's a grandparent, maybe yes. it's an aunt and uncle. You know, so, I mean, that, that makes sense. If it's just some random person you know from, like, PTA or something, that's rude. In working with parents, have you found effective ways to help a parent understand that this is not just laziness or distraction or, you know, a trouble kid? Well, I meet parents where they're at. What I mean by that is I ask them, you know, tell me what you know about ADHD. And uh, where are some places that you've got the information from? What questions do you have? Now, sometimes it's just that um, just by accident, people have gone on to websites that don't have a lot of valid information. Sometimes uh, a, a family member took medication for ADHD and they may have had side effects. And so what I talk to parents about is um, you know, let me look at what you've learned about it and let me tell you what I know about it and let's put our heads together and come up with a solution that best helps your child. Uh, and also I would explain that there's a difference between can't and won't. It's not that your child doesn't want to do their chores. It's that they can't remember multi-step tasks. And there's a big difference between can't and won't. And we really need to focus on the fact that EDC brain can't do some things rather than looking at it as a won't, which is a willful behavior. My son, who's 11, is diagnosed with ADHD, and uh, we were at a family visit, and another family member was trying to, for some reason, kind of take over the parenting of my son because he wasn't going to bed or he was having a meltdown or he was just generally having a hard time, overtired, overstimulated. And afterwards, we had a discussion about it, and this family member said, well, you know, I think that with just a little more discipline and a little bit better parenting, he's going to be fine. So that kind of stuck with me for a lot of years and kind of changed my relationship with that person probably forever. Stephanie, can scientists actually see ADHD in somebody's brain? You can actually see it on scans, yeah, and, and functional MRIs. It's called an fMRI. What that means is it's an MRI done while you're doing stuff. So there are studies where people are doing tasks that involve their executive functions. So first, executive functions are in the frontal lobe of your brain, and they do things like planning, uh, thinking ahead, learning from consequences, So what happens is we have people do these tasks while we're scanning their brains. And you can see in ADHD people when they're given a test that is of their executive functioning, their brain does not connect, their neurons do not communicate as well as in the non-ADHD brain. And also, parts of the ADHD brain are more active where they kind of shouldn't be. So people are paying attention to stuff they shouldn't be paying attention to and not paying attention to the stuff that they should be. Now I want to go have an fMRI, but I'm not going to. But I think... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, and... It, and it's not, fMRIs aren't standard parts of treatment. I get asked that a lot by parents. Uh, we, we don't have those as standard treatment, but uh, in studies, they do use them. Right. So if most parents aren't going to get their child a brain scan, what are the other ways that we can tell that someone has ADHD? Uh, there are tests called executive function tests, and those are computer tests that you are given where you have a stimulus or a thing on the screen, and you're asked to press the space bar, click the mouse, Uh, when you see the thing and not when you don't see the thing. And one of the things that the executive function tests look for is your ability to have selective attention. Selective attention means that you're focused on the thing on the screen and you're blurring out everything else. So that's something that people with ADHD have difficulties with. Also, at your doctor's visit, you may be asked about uh, a history of symptoms of your child or yourself, and you can fill out scales about that behavior. So those are ADHD rating scales. And we also ask a lot of questions about you know, how things are at school and how things are at home and how they differ. We also ask what's worked in the past, too, for ADHD, because that makes a big difference in how we might be able to help you, is we want to focus on what's worked well so we can get you further on the path to where you want to be. So, Amanda, I want to know, how do you know that ADHD is real? How do I know that ADHD is real? 
I know that ADHD is real because we have dinner and my son has slid under the table and I'm just like, hey, can you sit up here? We're, we're good. You know, your food's up here. <laughs> I know that ADHD is real because my husband sets a timer to get my son's bedtime routine going and it's for both of them, not just wow. for my son. Uh -huh. I know that ADHD is real because we have chosen, we've made the choice to use medication mm -hmm. with our son. And when he doesn't take it, He's very scattered and he can say so. He can tell us that his brain is moving too fast. So we know it's real because when he takes that medication, he slows down a little bit too. And he can he can he can respond to other things that we're doing as well as medication. He can respond to lists and checklists and prompts and things like mm -hmm. that. And I know it's real because I feel like I am the only person in my house who's taking care of the executive functioning, like the <laughs> organizing and planning and all of those things. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, there's just no way to not know it's real in our house. I realized ADHD was real when I had my daughter and she had these issues, not just focus and attention. She just has a whole lot of hyperactivity. And, you know, being that she's a 25-weeker, her brain development was truncated by the fact that she came out so premature. My name is Andy. I'm a dad and a psychologist who works with families of kids with learning and attention issues. I also have ADHD myself. When people say that they don't believe in the existence of ADHD, for me it's like denying the existence of gravity. I spend so much time of my life describing unique brains to parents, teachers, and students. Also because my brain, you know, has this condition. If I could sort of animate or create an image of my brain, there'd be butterflies and hummingbirds and sort of cats wandering around this really rich, colorful landscape. The challenge is that, you know, my brain is working so hard to try to sort and put this information together. And, you know, it's harder at times to find all the treasures and information that's there. It's not always orderly or predictable or responding the same way as other people. Um, but ultimately, when I've learned my strategies and I've taught strategies to the kids I work with, um, they're capable of doing as much or even more than other people who don't have this condition. Amanda, we've been talking about some of the really unhelpful things that people say when they learn that your child has ADHD. I have this horrible feeling that I may have said some clueless things myself at one point or another simply because I didn't know better at the time. So for people like me, people who really want to understand and be supportive, do you have any advice? What I appreciate about what you just said is that you want to understand, yeah. right? And that's the part that I think is really important, the people who want to understand. And I think there are a lot of things that people say when they don't understand mm -hmm. that come out poorly. Things like, I, oh, I don't want my kid to have that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I don't want him to be labeled. You're better you than me. Better you than me. Or I don't know how you handle this. Or mm -hmm. one of my least favorite phrases is, you know, you don't have anything more than you can handle. And yeah. I'm always thinking, I have more than I can handle <laughs> all the time, right? <laughs> but I, I think that just saying, like, I want to understand this. And just saying sometimes, and you do this a lot, Lexi. Mm -hmm. I think you say to me, like, I don't think I'm going to get this right, but I have a question for yeah. you. And I think just naming that is really important. It helps me feel a lot less judged when people are saying to me, I'm just really curious and I'm trying to figure this out yeah. and I want to do what I can for you. And sometimes just not saying anything is really helpful. Right. I, I wonder, and I'm, I'm just thinking about interactions that you've had with other parents of kids who have ADHD, whether or not they know that your kid has ADHD. Is it, I mean, do you ever encounter those times where you're, running through your head how you can bring up whether or not ADHD is an issue for another family? I tend not to ask mm -hmm. because I think they'll tell me if they want to tell mm -hmm. me. But sometimes I'll give them the, you know, hey, this looks really familiar. Mm -hmm. And then oh, wow. give them the opening, right? Oh, this is really familiar. We deal with this in our house a lot. Or he looks a lot like, like my kid wow. right now. And it gives them that opening. If they want to say anything, they can say something. That's so smart. So, Stephanie, people like grandparents who, like, it's maybe not something that's totally familiar mm -hmm. to them where you can't limit that interaction. What's what's the best way 
to sort of navigate that when grandparents are saying, well, we didn't have ADHD back in our day? It's okay if they don't believe the ADHD is real, but, you know, as parents, we choose to believe the research and believe the science that says this is a real thing and we're going to treat it like that. And I think it's important to sit with grandparents and say, okay, so these are the things that we do with our kids because it's really important that grandparents and parents are on the same page. And these are the things that we would appreciate if we stuck with, like if it's really important that your kids get outside for a certain amount of time just to go out and play because being outside helps the ADHD brain kind of calm down. You can say to grandparents, well, I'd, I'd really like it if the kids could be out like two hours a day playing, you know, supervised playing, just free play. Yeah, that's a really good way to handle that. I like that. Is it, you don't have, you know, you don't necessarily have to say, I believe this is real, but here's what we're doing to help this child. I love that. Right. I think it's a great idea. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're it. welcome. Anytime. Can you think of a time when your son's ADHD came up and someone handled it well? Definitely. One of the best experiences I ever had was, so I always worry about taking him to play dates because mm-hmm. I never know whether I say something, do I not say something, yeah. do I drop him off, do I stay, do I hover, like all of those kinds of things. And I brought him to a play date and I started to say, I said, you know, I just want to let you know he has ADHD. And the mom said, oh yeah, we've got that in our house too. Ah. We've got this handled. <laughs> And I just went, whew, like that was such a relief. Mm. I felt like she knew how to handle this. And I felt like she was saying to me, go to the grocery store, get your errands done without your kid. Mm -hmm. We've got this. Yeah. We're in this with you. Yeah. Did you feel less worried about how he was going to do on the play date or did it alleviate needing to even think through how he would do? I wasn't worried about how he would do. Mm. I was worried about how he'd be perceived. And that's what changed for me is I didn't have any concerns about the perceptions of the parents in that house anymore. Yeah. Wow. Do you still play date with that family? All the time. (laughs) You've been listening to In It, a podcast from Understood for Parents. Our website is understood.org, where you can find all sorts of free resources for people raising kids with learning and attention issues. We also want to hear what you think of this podcast. In It is for you, so we want to make sure you're getting what you need. Go to you.org slash podcast to share your thoughts and find resources. That's the letter U, as in understood, dot org slash podcast. And if you like what you heard today, please tell somebody about it. Share it with the parents at your bus stop, tell your special education support group, or send a link to your child's pediatrician. You can also go to Apple Podcasts and rate us, which is a great way to let other people know about In It. You can subscribe to In It on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, or keep up with us however you listen to podcasts. Between episodes, you can find Understood on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. Or visit our website, u.org slash podcast. That's the letter u dot org slash podcast. And come back next time when we'll be talking about what happens when someone asks your child with dyslexia to read out loud. Did you count until you got to your paragraph? Of course I count. I still do that now. Um, I count until you get to your paragraph. I'd go to the restroom when it was like two people before me and then stay there so I know that it would be like two people after me. If this rings a bell and you have a story to share, you can call in and leave a voice message that we just might use on the next episode of In It. You'll find that number at u.org slash podcast. In It is a production of Understood for Parents. In It is produced by Blake Eskin of Noun and Verb Rodeo and Julie Subrin. Mike Errico wrote our theme music. And Laura Kushner is the director of editorial content at Understood for Parents. Thank you so much for being in it with us. And thanks for listening. <laughs>